the smell of grass and leather There were days when we'd play too We'd cross the lines when the sun would shine And make our dreams come true I had a glove on my hand and a girl in the stands She stole my heart like a hit and run It seems the world was so much simpler back then we was just out there for fun I pray for someone to hold your hand And baseball in the summer Someone to walk with you When this world grows cold Baseball in the summer Baseball in the summer Welcome to the Brock V. Mac podcast. I am your, you know, host. And between the two of us, we kind of look like we could be talking to each other, except <laughs> he's a better looking version. Uh, please welcome Brock Badger alumnus, Matt King. How are you, Matt? Good. I'm doing really well, Mike. It's good to see you. Yeah, it's been a long time and not quite 30 years like the rest of it, of everybody. I think we had a a passing at a uh remember what was the name of that the ta sports complex playing yes. slow pitch in london yes so, i think at one point yeah <laughs> yeah you know, that was a long time too <laughs> yeah well you, you you haven't changed a bit it's oh. unbelievable so i you know i had hair when i was playing at brock but yeah. you uh you've been saying. rocking the the wood for a while right yeah when you lose your hair when you're 20 years old it doesn't take much to <laughs> not look different right Amazing. So, so yeah. why don't we just start with what you're doing today, Matt? Because I, I think it's kind of cool given the number of people that have graduated into sports and leading and educating. So yeah. uh, why don't you tell everybody what you're up to these days? Well, first, I just, again, I know a lot of guys have said the same thing. But I just want to say thanks to you, Mike, for doing this and putting us together because it's been, I've gone down a, rock, a Brock rabbit hole the past uh, few days and it's been great to see some faces that I really, you know, I really haven't seen for a long time because uh, being where I am. So thank you for doing this. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm in a, an educator. I'm one of those guys. Uh, I've been teaching. This is my 25th year. Um, and so I started off fairly quickly after Brock and I'm, I'm still doing that. I'm a phys ed teacher by trade and at high school level. Um, and I got a pretty unique job now connected with that. So we can talk about more later on, but I'm still down in around the London area and living in the country just outside of St. Mary's. So with yeah, my I know. Uh, wife and three boys. So, Oh my goodness. That's a lot. So <laughs> yeah. that's, that's amazing, Matt. Um, and, and, you know, obviously, uh, you know, Southwestern Ontario is a, a different kind of a place. It's, uh, London is, is an exciting city to work in and, mm -hmm. um, you know, before we get there, did you, did you grow up? You grew up in St. Mary's, is that correct? Is that home for you? Sort of, yeah. I grew up in the country just outside of St. Mary's. So St. Mary's is the closest town. Um, I grew up on a, essentially a farm. Um, we grew up on 100 acres. And my, my dad was a my, – my grandparents and my uncle were farmers, dairy farmers. And my dad uh, didn't farm, but we had cash crop and we had uh, the younger cattle actually at our property. Um, and, you know, at that time actually – chickens and all kinds of craziness. Um, but yeah, still, still out in the country, um, with the, you know, the biggest metropolis was St. Mary's. Now at that time, I think it maybe had 4,000 people. Or so. <laughs> but it does have the Canadian baseball hall of fame. It does now it does. They've done a good job with that. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's exciting. And, um, so like, I'd assume that organized sports were something that you eventually got into. Were you a typical Canadian rural kid playing hockey or was it hockey baseball or how did that yeah, all hockey, start? Hockey is very much the dominant sport in town in St. Mary's. Um, I was able to play some community stuff. A lot of, um, I think I was, um, somebody had mentioned earlier about fastball. Uh, fastball was the big thing in our area actually. And so I was able to play, basically a rural fastball and, and at the beginning and, and got involved with that. And then about, it wasn't until about the time I was about 14 where hardball or baseball became an option for us. 
uh, in St. Mary's. Um, but at the same time, I was playing hockey, and and I was one of those kids who just tried everything. Um, I loved, I loved sports. Um, we played soccer. We did, you know, basically everything I could do to to get out of the house and sometimes get away from doing some chores. So, well, I think I think we all uh, <laughs> tried to lollygag our way through. Um, what was I mean? So. Tell me a little bit about your high school experience. Were you playing uh, sports in high school? And, and, you know, did you have uh, a lot of people talked about the influence of their brothers or their, yeah. you know, family and their love of sports and it kind of shaping where they were going. Um, tell us a little bit about high school and, and maybe a little bit of your graduation into. For sure. You know. So um, in high school, I played everything that I could. Um, I actually became into volleyball a fair bit as well. So I was, we had a really a dedicated volleyball coach at high school who was one of the phys ed teachers who had come from Western. Um, and little did we realize at the time that he had a pretty strong coaching pedigree um, and eventually started the four city volleyball club. He was one of the original members there. So we were lucky to have that, but we were a bunch of, you know, non-volleyball players, nowhere near the level of the club commitment that exists now. But I played volleyball in high school. I played basketball in high school until my high school got a hockey team. Then I played high school hockey in the grade 11. We did not have high school baseball. Um, so in the spring, I did track and field. And um, I'm trying to think what else. Those are the biggest ones that we did. Uh, I did a little bit of soccer, but it was kind of a short stint. Um, but at the same time, outside of high school it's kind of when baseball i really got the baseball bug i had like a lot of others i love the game um you know hearing the jays on the radio was always a big thing my dad was a a big jays fan and had been involved in some of that the rsa which is the the softball association he had done some fastball stuff um but i had just sort of been around the game but not at a high level and then around my grade nine year was when I made the move to the big town of St. Mary's and played on the first on a rep team there and was kind of fortunate that I was able to progress fairly quickly in baseball, partly because a lot of players weren't, a lot of people weren't playing, but I was a decent size and decently athletic. And very quickly I played up a year or two or sometimes three years, actually. Um, I was playing midget ball when I was in Pee Wee. Um, and partly because they needed bodies, partly because I kind of got the game and partly because eventually I wasn't afraid to go behind the plate. Um, and at some point that, that was a, an interesting thing because, you know, very few people wanted to do that. So, yeah, I, I think it takes a specific kind of person to want to put on the armor, but more than that, <laughs> you're kneeling all game, you know, you're on your, yeah. your it's tough on your knees, tough on your legs and yeah. um, hotter than hell. I mean, <laughs> people don't understand that part of it too. Um, Matt, what, you know, do you remember what went into the decision or what universities you were considering at the time? Obviously oh. being that close to London, you know, it's a natural general gravitation to, to go to Western, but um you know, I assume that maybe you wanted to get away from the London area or what, what led to, yeah. do you remember what your school choices were? Yeah, I actually, so from a young age, I got the teaching bug. Um, I kind of always had it in my mind that I wanted to teach and at the same time coach. Uh, I started coaching as in high school, actually. I, I did a lot of coaching in high school and started the certification process for a lot of sports when I was 15 and 16 years old. Um, so those were always in the back of my mind. And to be honest, university undergrad was sort of a means to an end. I wanted to get in and get out and start teaching. That was my, my goal. So I did get accepted to Western. Um, I also had this kind of desire to get away from home a little bit. So I actually got into Nipsing. Um, and then Brock was on that list as well. Um, it was interesting because Brock was kind of number three. Uh, and then I did a visit to the campus and I really enjoyed the size. And I think a lot of people have said this, the community feel at Brock. Um, I liked the setup. I liked the fact that it was, you know, a couple hours away from home, but close enough that if I needed to, I could get back. Um, and it was, 
interesting because uh, I know some other guys have talked about it. We can talk about it more if you want, but the, the phys ed program, believe it or not, was actually recommended to me by a coach who said that the movement education program at Brock is great for coaches and teachers because you learn to see how people move and react and blah, blah, blah. And he had this great spiel. And I thought, all right, why not give it a shot and see what it's all about? <laughs> um, little did I know that I would be doing some educational gymnastics and some dance and things like that, but I ended up sticking it out. So it was kind of. You, you would be one of the few that didn't yeah. immediately transfer over to the sports management part. So that's, it's great to hear a perspective from someone that, yeah. um, you know, succeeded and got through that program. So I'm sure that yeah. given that you're employed as a phys ed teacher and yeah. doing some other things that we'll talk about later, um, maybe proof that the people at Brock also knew what they were doing a little bit. Um, you know, so do you remember what it was like being a freshman at Brock? Because you were, you know, you'd been a student prior to there being a baseball team and, and were you yeah. in residence first year? And so I ended up, and I don't remember the exact circumstances surrounding it, but I ended up at the downtown student res. Um, mm. And that was the first year that it had, been open. So that was my first year of, of schooling. Uh, and it was, Brock was interesting for me too, because I really didn't know anybody. Um, all of my friends went to Laurier or Waterloo, Guelph, Western, obviously. So there was a larger influx of people that direction. And, you know, I ended up going to Brock and it was kind of on an island to begin with, and then being down at this downtown student res, even more so. Um, and it was interesting because I, I mean, certainly I met a lot of people and and uh, had a good experience eventually. Um, I actually started out, it's kind of a funny story. I ended up being a roommate of a mature student who was local, who was literally getting out of the house to get away from his mom. Oh boy. And he was 24. I want to say 25 and one of the strangest individuals I've ever met in my entire life. <laughs> so I kind of uh, had that unique op experience where I'm like, A, I'm away from home. B, I'm not really surrounded by people I know. And then all of a sudden I'm with this, with this character that we ended up calling Screech and uh, from sort of like that Saved by, for Saved by the Bell character. <laughs> and it was kind of a disaster, to be honest. It was, uh, I was kind of there. I, the, I kind of had that initial feeling about the movement education at part at Brock. Like I, just like the other guys, probably you, like my high school phys ed was very much performance-based. Um, you know, you got, you were tested against standards. You were, you know, if you got 10 foul shots and you got nine of them in, that was your mark for that part. Right? You know, if you, it was very much structured and, all of a sudden we get to Brock and they're talking about Rudolph Labin and movement. And, the, and it's just like all of this at the same time. And it was like, Oh my God, what, a, what is going on here? So my first year, my first semester of first year was kind of wild. Um, in from that perspective. Um, but eventually, um, you know, I started to settle in. You know, obviously you do, you meet people, you, you get involved. I, I was, latching on to the intramurals very quickly. Um, luckily, there was a guy down the hall who was kind of sick of his roommate that uh, I think he was throwing a ball against the wall or something, like one of those little, uh, some kind of an indoor ball or rubber ball or something. And I happened to have my hockey stick there. So his ball rolled down the hall. And so I shot it back at him with my stick. And that started a conversation and he ended up being a good friend of mine through school and, and so on. But it was sketchy for a while. And well, I'll admit it. I was, uh, I was a little bit concerned about what I had done to be honest, to get there. <laughs> I'm so far away from home and I'm in this, you know, the downtown student residence is kind of a weird island away from, you know, it's, it's it kind of a unique experience. Ryan Thompson spoke about the same thing where yeah. it was, um, he found it tough to, it felt like you were being shipped off to some other world a little bit. Yeah. And I think Ryan, I believe was the year after I was, I only lasted a year there. Um, lots of people stayed for more than one. I, I didn't love it. Um, 
I didn't love the food situation. It was it was just a strange. It just didn't feel great for me. You know, taking the and also too, you got to remember, I'm coming from the smaller area, smaller town. Got to take a bus everywhere. All of a sudden, you're you're really just kind of stuck there. So it, it worked out fine eventually after that for that year. But at the beginning, I was like, oh my god, what is going on here? <laughs> Uh, but so I think showing the resilience to go to second year is, yeah. is, is a lot. There's a ton of people that don't make it through yeah. their first year. So, yeah. um, you know, do you remember what the summer was like in, in, I can't recall. I, I don't think, I think you were in the third year when we launched the baseball program. So, no. Uh, so actually instance. it was the second semester of my first year. Okay. When, when the tables went up and the, the posters and, you know what, to be honest, baseball came at a perfect time for me because, you know, as I was just saying, that first semester was a bit of a mess. Um, I was really kind of not lost, but questioning what I was doing. And I remember just like some of the other guys had said, I was walking down the hall and I saw this sign about baseball club. And I'm like, I like baseball. I played, you know, actually at that time I was playing a lot of men's league baseball Um and bouncing back and forth between fastball and baseball and trying to just jump on teams wherever I could um, end up getting called up a lot for different things. And I said, you know, I'm okay. I can hold my own. I, I you know, believe it or not, the stats, we don't have to talk about them, but um, I actually was a really good hitter at the yeah. time. <laughs> um, and I thought I'm going to give this a shot. Right. Just, yeah. and then I know you and Ted, I remember specifically you and Ted at the table. Um, doing the signups and I got that little sheet of paper that you gave out and filling it out and everything was great. And I got to the question about your current team or something along those lines. Yeah. And that's where I didn't know if I would even have a chance because I really didn't have that pedigree of coming from, you know, the Lee side or Oshawa or Burlington or the place where a lot of the guys ended up coming from. And that, that kind of was a, worry right from the start but i ended up you know putting it down and then those indoor workouts started and i really loved being part of it so it was it was a perfect time for me because it it made my first year finish great uh gave me something to look forward to in the summertime um and i and i really finished first year at a much happier place than i was sort of halfway through first year so it was awesome <laughs> that way so I I do remember, you know, it's, I remember like uh, certain things about, um, the indoor workouts. And I remember that you were, uh, you know, like there were a lot of catchers first yeah. off and, uh, we all had to be sequestered up into the, <laughs> into the ballet studio. And I, I think <laughs> I can't imagine what it was like from the point of view of a catcher, because there was a real hard line between people who could actually hit the glove and those guys who couldn't hit the broad side of a barn and yeah. uh but we had a lot of catchers too and we would always have these kind of weird elements where the catchers would participate a little bit in the gym and then they'd have to go upstairs with the pitchers and I kind of always yeah. felt bad for you guys because you had to pull double duty well, um, yeah and that sorry, that kind of ended up being my whole year right I, <laughs> um but you know from the catching sample what i do remember i forget what store who you were talking to i do remember the ball going through the wall um, up in the balcony up there that, that I can't remember the name of the guy, but um, you know, it was straight and hard, but five feet away from where it should have been. It was awful. And then I do remember, I do remember the breaking balls hitting well before you like gaining gaining speed and gaining momentum and, and all of a sudden I was like, okay, do I block it or like do we do we get out of the way? Like so I remember I forget, I think we quite often had two two guys throwing at a time and yep. catchers would be diving all over the place and most of the time it was to get out of the way of the ball, not to catch it because he never knew where it was gonna go. Um so that was interesting, that whole upstairs part of that. And then uh yeah, as you said, the the gym I do remember, it's funny because I do remember kind of being chaotic, but I do also remember leaving there and saying that was one of the more organized practices that I'd ever been at. And it was in a gym with 
way too many people. Um, so that very quickly got me thinking about what kind of a program this is going to be. And, and it, it made me think, you know, okay, hey, maybe this is something real, right? This is something that we're going to be part of. It was hard to keep organized because we yeah. had the, the revolving door of coaches early. Uh, I'm, I'm, the details start to come back to you after a little while. And I remember that Cardis and Sharp and Briggs Jude were the three initially. Yeah. And then Cardis had some sort of health issue and, and, uh, Sharp was just not able to make it to a few practices. So then that begat Coach McRae. But Coach mm -hmm. McRae was still involved with what he was doing in Erie, I think, at the time. He was yep. at Erie Community College. and um, But Tim Topping came, the, the pitching coach. And, you know, that must have calmed it. I think that calmed everyone down because he, you know, he kind of calmed the the pitching up in the ballet studio down to the point where he brought those plates that they would put on the floor. Yeah. And um, at that point, I think we had started to kind of limit the amount of absolute people that would <laughs> throw it five feet wide of a catcher. But yeah. um, I also do remember we did a lot of running and a lot of, you know, like it, it just was a lot of exercise really too. For sure. And, and I can't remember if it was Coach Topping or somebody finally had this brainwave to, you know, the blue gymnastics mats? Yeah. Finally, someone said, let's put this down in front of the catchers. <laughs> so if the, ball hit, you know, if the ball hits that, at least it's absorbed a little bit. It's Because uh, I do I specifically remember the ricochet off the floor. And I can't remember if it was tile up there or what it was, but it was – no, it was nasty. So. Yeah, that was that wasn't the easiest thing we put you guys through, and it just gets worse from there. Right. Um, you know, do you remember? Like, we did some cuts and stuff, and um, you know, is there any? You know, did you feel any trepidation at that point, or do you, you know, had Coach LePage, or um, do you remember your first talk with a coach? I don't. It's funny because I tried to remember. I'm terrible with some details and. I was trying to remember the first time I did have a conversation with, and I don't really remember specific in-depth conversations with anybody. A lot of them were very positive, which kind of gave me that push to keep going. But I did remember thinking I, I'm out of my league here, you know, and I didn't know what to expect. And then as the, believe it or not, as the bullpen sessions went on and the hitting part went on, I think it was coach Kemp that I actually, gave me some really positive feedback about my swing. Um, and and that, you know, that's always something good to hear. And then I don't know if it was Coach Topping or LePage. I can't remember who spent most of the time coaching the catchers specifically. But they they did a nice job of just telling me to just play. Um, yeah. Because I was a little nervous. I'll fully admit that. Um, I was a little, not overwhelmed, but, it, it, you know, it was just – it was different. And that part of it, somebody told me, they said, you're fine. Like, just catch the ball. Like just, you know, simplify things. And, and I think it was that whole idea of simplifying the process that really gave me some confidence to say, oh, I might be able to stick around here. So it was, it's really it was good hard. that way. Even, even in the gym workouts, um, typically teams have a lot of outfielders and a lot of pitchers. Yep. And so the hardest cuts typically happen at those positions where there's a lot of depth and there's a lot of numbers. Yeah, for sure. For some reason at Brock, uh, we had a lot of first basemen and a ton of catchers. Yeah. And, um, you know, so we'll talk a little bit about that as we kind of advance towards the infamous training camp. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, obviously you advanced out of the indoor workouts and, have a summer to look forward to things, you know, how did you prep for the first season? So this is where I tried to figure this out. I don't remember which team I played for. I remember kind of being in a bit of panic mode because as I said, I, I was kind of focused on coming to Brock three years, teaching out type of thing. And my dad had worked at Labatt's actually in London and they, I ended up getting a scholarship from them as well and ended up getting a summer job with them, which was amazing. Um, they paid super well, but the problem was it was shift work. I mm -hmm. ended up working the three the three shifts that they do at the, at the BATS when I was, uh, I ended up working in their shipping department. And 
I thought, what am I going to do? I can't play ball on a competitive team and have afternoons and night shifts and be driving all over Southern Ontario. So I ended up playing on a very, very high level men's fastball team and then ended up being part of a team. And again, I don't remember if it was the prior to first year or prior to second year um, of, of my schooling. I ended up playing on this team in Stratford that was, um, I think the junior Hillers at that time, um, I don't know if they were in a bit of a hiatus. So there was a team that replaced them um, that I played for as an underager. I was still underage for whatever it was. Um, my, and I don't remember exactly the team. And between those two worlds, I pieced together a summer of competitive <laughs> baseball that wasn't perfect. It wasn't ideal in terms of the training that was probably required to play at a program like Brock, but it still kept me in the game. It still kept the bat going. It, it allowed me to catch. And and believe it or not, I, did, I played a lot of outfield eventually. You know, I think like a lot of us, I played everywhere. I played, you know, I was a shortstop and a pitcher, both for fastball and baseball. Um, and then eventually when I was playing with these com competitive teams for fastball, they really liked my arms. So I played a lot of outfield. Um, and the guy that I ended up being outfield partners with actually played for team Canada for fastball. And it, it was a fun because he taught me a ton from that perspective, but between the two of us, it was just a race to see who could get to the ball first, because we just wanted to throw somebody out, um, <laughs> which is easier to do on a fastball diamond, right? Cause it's smaller. Yeah. And uh, so I, I pieced together that summer of baseball slash fastball um, with probably three teams, eventually just kind of getting called up and filling in and doing these things. And then that kind of led into that training camp in late August. Yeah, boy. And, you know, I, I think for all of us that had done the winter spring workout piece, that first day of training camp was something else because all of a sudden we're there and there's lots of new people. For and, sure. And lots of talent, right? Um, yeah. And that's that's where I really got a, concerned because I think, I don't know what they said or somebody had mentioned um, – having a uniform with your name on it. And, and I'm looking around at all these teams that guys are playing for. And I'm like, Oh boy, like I've, I had some ID camp opportunities and things like that, but I didn't really have that Jersey, right. That uh, showed that I was on a bona fide team or a program. Uh, so that really was, and I do remember coming home from that first day going, okay, we're, we're into it now. Right. Like this is the real <laughs> deal. Uh, this is see what we can do. Right. So. Yeah, yeah, but the catchers are a strange, strange crew, I think, to say the yeah. least, you know, and interesting from that perspective. Do you remember what it was like, you know, do you, do you remember the interactions with the coaches at, at camp because they were much different than they were at the winter workout stuff where they, they were serious. I mean, Mike was, yeah. especially when Mike was there, he was pretty serious about stuff, but it took on a whole new tone that very first day of camp where it was activity all the time and all the yep. coaches were at their coaching and coach Kemp, coach Lounsbury were there, you yep. know, um, do you remember what you were, you know, your early reflections at camp and any memories of some of the ridiculousness that happened yeah. there? Well, well, beyond the running and, <laughs> and the lunges, um, which I know a lot of people have talked about. Um, I do remember from a catching perspective, getting some very specific, instructions right so all of a sudden it wasn't good enough just to catch a ball it was okay you're going to frame it you're going to set it up you're going to move you know you're going to be in position you're it was very detail oriented very quickly and i enjoyed that because i i part of the reason i stuck with catching is the cerebral part of the game right? i loved thinking the game of baseball and obviously that's a big part of catching um so i do remember it got very specific very quickly and it was repetition, 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 and, and, you know, blocking. And, and I don't remember if it started during the workouts or shortly after, but correct me if I'm wrong, but is there a, there a cement wall or a cement backing or a stone wall or stone backing of some sort at Thorold or maybe a yeah, building? Yeah, I think there's a building with the, yeah. uh, you know, and I think the dugouts may have had a little extension that where it was yeah. like a, a brick wall. I, I seem to recall drill with an S 
of balls being thrown over your shoulder at the wall, bouncing back, and you had to block and frame and do all these things. And, you know, some of us came with wrist guards and things like that, and, you know, the things that catches were, but most of us didn't. And I actually remember going, you know, we're, we're getting bruised <laughs> already, and it's day one. Um, so that, you know, but, but as I said, like, I really enjoyed that repetition and the specificity of it. It was really neat to see the thought process behind playing at a little higher level. Um, and then in terms of hitting, I love, I love the breakdown of how they did their hitting. And I don't know if that was coach Kemp's doing or, or McCray's, but just the process, you know, you did your T work, you did your bullpen work or your, your screen work. Then you did some drills. Then you got out to the thought, like everything had a purpose. And, and I remember again, thinking, you know, this is the best practice slash tryout I've ever been part of anywhere, including some of the ID camps that I went to. Um, so I was really excited to do that. But I also, as lots of people have said, I do remember being exhausted <laughs> and, and, That's tiring. and just busy, busy, busy. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, look at the, the catching position had, I mean, Matt, uh, none of, no one had met, Matt Fletcher, he was an nope. incoming freshman. Nate Capusa had been with us in the um, indoor workouts and stuff. So I think Nate was, you know, uh, was really going to be the, you know, quite a yep. big factor, except that he got hurt doing yep. the, the lunges. Um, but I do remember you, you being really good to second base. Okay, this is one thing that the coaches did say to me is they really liked how you threw down to second. And, uh, you know, so I think the other thing I remember is you guys always would have to do drills with tennis balls where you were bouncing them in front of you and you were practice blocking constantly. We did a ton of that. Yeah. A ton of, um, tennis ball. And then also a lot of framing without a glove on. Um, and I can't remember, I believe it was with a tennis ball too, but you know, throw somebody behind you, throw the ball and you had to, you know, to frame it, right. No matter where it was. And we did that. I felt like we did that forever. Um, but it, it, it taught you a lot about the game. It's it's funny to see the game now, like as a catcher, uh, how they are in their position and then how they, you know, pull the ball up from way below the strike zone to, into it. Whereas all we did was rotate our hand, right? You turn the glove in, you, frame, you, you, you kept it still, you gave, caught it in the center of your body. So the umpire looked over your shoulder and saw the, you know, you know, you, you cheat that outside corner by moving out there and not by reaching out there and, and little things like that. But, the tennis ball drills, the blocking. Uh, we did a ton of that stuff. Yeah, for sure. Do you, do, do you remember uh, the cut down day or, or as we got closer to the end of camp, did you start to feel a little bit like less uh, on, on ice edge or I on, on the ice about it? I, I really didn't know what to think. Um, I had done, I had done okay. I had a pretty good camp. Um, considering that 90% of the stuff that we were doing, I had never done before. Um, so it was neat that I had some positive feedback from a defensive position. They, I remember them thinking that I was calm behind the plate, which was a, always a plus as a catcher. And as you mentioned, I always had a decent pop time um, and I always had a decent arm. Um, and then at some point during that week, they asked me to do a bunch of outfield repetitions as well. Now we had a, I mean, you know, those three guys, or even four guys um, were outstanding outfielders, um, and all just unbelievably talented. And then, but I got some reps out there and my footwork was decent enough. My arm was decent enough. Um, I didn't make any big mistakes. And so all of a sudden they're asking me about outfield too. Like, what do you think about playing? I, you know, I was like, I'll play wherever you want me to play. Um, so it was interesting because I didn't know because I kind of felt like I you know, I knew I wasn't in that top, probably number two, one, two catching. So I didn't think I had a real shot there. And I didn't really f think I was going to be in the top four for outfield. So I'm like, I don't, I don't know. It was a, it was a little interesting leaving there going, oh, I have no idea what they're thinking. Right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the one, one thing that we can talk about though, is, um, you know, when you do make the team, and that must have been exciting when you, 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 oh, know, sure. you get the jersey and, yeah. you know, you're with the guys and stuff. Um, 
you had a really good relationship with the pitchers, especially the veteran pitchers. So you had to warm all of us up, all the, which is thankless work sometimes. And I yeah. kind of make fun of the fact that you're probably black and blue because <laughs> we had some pitchers that were hellacious to catch. Oh, yeah. They were just, you know, they bounced their, they had hard breaking stuff. So it would bounce a lot. And yeah. sometimes their fastballs would bounce. And, um, but you develop a really good relationship with the pitchers because you're warming them up and they'll kind of talk to you about whether they're feeling good or whether they're feeling bad or, um, you know, I would talk a little bit about the relationship with the pitchers, because I think that's one of the very underrated things that you had going for you is you were just calm and positive and you had these, you know, I freely admit it. Pitchers are divas. They just are. We are yeah. all unique personalities who have different little nuances and quirks and it's very rarely straight. Um, tell me a little bit about, you know, what it was like catching some of our pitchers and, you know, there's a few in between in particular I want to ask about, but go ahead. It's, it's funny because I don't, or even prior to like, like kind of listening to some of these, I didn't really remember specifics. Like there's a few obvious ones. I remember Ebel fastball, you know, and just being straight and hard. Um, I remember Vertures, he threw such a heavy ball. Um, he, had a, he had that live arm, and it was interesting because I don't know about you guys, but I kind of grew up in that era of pitchers kind of looked similarly in, in their delivery, and they tried to coach it out of you if you were a, you know, a three-quarter slot guy or if you were not sort of the regular over the top. And, and Vertures' arm was a little more three-quarters, if I remember, and heavy, really heavy. And even his fastball, uh, it's something if you caught it with your glove wrong, it hurt your like it hurt your thumb. It would constantly be in that raw. It just felt like you caught it wrong all the time. And then he also had a, a biting slider, if I remember, yeah. that was nasty because sometimes it didn't go where it was supposed to, but a lot of times it did its job, which meant it was out of the strike zone. So you had to be prepared <laughs> to. You had to be, like, we had, uh, you know, how, how far am I going to have to jump to block this one, right? Because we're probably going to get a swing and miss if, if you're in a game situation. Um, and you want that fight. You want that pitch to be thrown because that, that was a go-to, right? Uh, so I remember those two. I, I remember, I think it was Ronnie Stroud. Ronnie? Or, or, I was um, going to say, Ron's yeah. probably, and he, he would be the first to admit it. Yeah. Probably black and blue from catching yeah. Ron. He, yeah. Uh, <laughs> It took him a while to get going some days, um, you know, and and various, I forget the exact pitches he threw, but I feel like he had a lot of spin on a number of pitches. So nothing was sort of natural, like normal, if I remember calling it. So that kind of fed into that sort of some temporarily wild, you know, like you never kind of knew what was happening. Because I feel like, and I, and again, I might be wrong with this, but I feel like they played with his grip a lot um, at that time, and it caused chaos with the ball. <laughs> he never, yeah, he never Ron, knew what was happening. Ron was one of the few guys I knew, um, and I pitched with a lot of people yeah. that threw uh, that had both a fastball or bat, both a slider and a curveball. Yeah. And he had two different types of curveballs. I think like it yeah. was like one of those situations where he had a lot of pitches. Yeah. Which is always, you know, like, uh, it's tough because he, you know, and Ebel had that knuckle curve thing yes. that he, he threw. So we had some exotic, and, and yep. Latour had the killer slider. So we had some exotic yep. stuff. He had Todd learning, and he threw yep. a hard curveball. Yep. And um, yeah, he, so. I think it was a 12-6, kind of a hard 12-6. Yeah, it was a hard 12-6. And, yeah. and so, you know, and Ted threw that. He also had a curve, you know, a yeah. twelve six that was snapped good. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think out of everybody, and you know, I'm not orthodox, you know, you could you must have just loved it when you had either probably Alex or uh yeah. Rob Green throwing to you because those guys had pretty yep. you know, pretty much standard stuff and everyone yeah, else was, was kind of crazy. Yeah, it was much more routine with those guys. <laughs> um and it was funny too, like even Joel and like some of the guys who had a little bit more experience, they had their routine already too, right? They didn't yeah. need me to do much other than 
set the glove up and 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 let them hit it basically or you know if something wasn't working okay let's work on this for a little bit more or you know are you comfortable because everybody had a different and a different routine as all pitchers do some guys took forever to warm up some guys you know didn't want to warm up <laughs> they just wanted to pitch um and then some of you were really methodical about the process that is so many curve or so many sliders so many you know, off speed or whatever it was. And um, learning that was part of the job too, right? Like learning what would help you as a pitcher be at your best. Because, um, you know, having pitched as well at a younger age, it was like, it kind of knew what it took to get somebody ready. And it and everybody was different. Like everybody had that little, you know, some guys, like I remember you were obviously, you keep saying it, you, you were in the zone. You were, it was pitching day. It was, this is what I do and this is how I get it done and let's go. Right. And other yeah. guys were just, oh, I think my arm's ready. <laughs> let's go. It, it, it was really hard for me because I would have to have these really good relationships with just the catchers and the pitching coach yeah. on the day that I pitched because everybody else like knew yeah. that I was a different person on that day. Like I'm a different person off the field, but and specifically off the field when you're charting or you're watching some other guy yeah. pitch and you're, I've always been, I was always a starting pitcher. I pitched in the bullpen for a little bit in high school and a quarter of my first season of junior. And then yeah. from there on in, I've never really pitched in the bullpen again. So there's a specific mental process that goes into it, but you have to explain that to your poor catcher in the bullpen who, yeah. You know, it's like, I'm going to grunt, I'm going to, you know, I might curse a bit, or I, I I just really got this specific thing we need to get done. And I would always start at 10 feet yep. and work my way back and and um, throw X number of curveballs, X number of fastballs. And, you know, I was one of those methodical people for someone, you know, but it, it's difficult because the, my personality was so different from when people would talk to me off the field. And you know, I think for you, I forgot about Joel. Joel was a young guy um, who had a wicked curveball and a good good heater too. But, you know, when his curveball was doing what we were all supposed to do, throw it in the dirt at two strikes and we all warm up with that. You guys, you, like all of you must have just been thinking, what do I need to do to get a fastball changeup guy here or something that does not involve stuff that bounces and hits and, you know, yeah. and, ricochets and the rest of it yeah there was a lot of time spent in the dirt for sure <laughs> <laughs> um do you remember you know kind of dealing with so you know the season starts obviously yeah. and uh you've you're part of a group that's handling this crazy collection of eccentric personalities and styles mm -hmm. um what was your relationship like with matt and nate so i didn't didn't get to spend much i mean we worked obviously in practice and stuff together and it was always good but i always um they had come from such good programs and had that experience and they had that pedigree i tried to learn as much as i could from them to be honest um and i just wanted to be able to do what they were doing at that level like i i i, I didn't think that i could but then i started to be able to and i you know i kind of got that little bit of okay, yeah, I belong here type of feel after a while. It took a while to, to get that, but um, they were always, you know, Nate um, was always positive. He was pretty helpful with some of the things that I was doing. Um, Matt was always just in his own when it was time to catch, right? It was, he was, he was a work worker, right? He was, I remember him just, it was like a job. Like he, he knew what he wanted to do and he was pretty dialed into that, right? And then, you know, as you kind of go through the year, you get separated a little bit because the drills, you know, you know, starting catchers do different things than the other guys. And but it was always positive, and actually with the whole team. Like I, I know other people have said this, but I was so happy to be part of that team because of the people were. It was just fun. It was great baseball, high skill level. Um, but great people to be around. And, and it just made, you know, as I said before, like it made that part of my schooling so much more enjoyable because I enjoyed, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed going to the ballpark. I enjoyed, 
And, and if you think back the hours of time that we spent, you know, on those double header days, you know, I, people always ask me, they say, what do you remember about playing um, at school? And I said, well, first of all, I was a member of the team. I didn't play a whole lot, but um, I remember, you know, I think it was two 30. We had to be at the diamond for a five o'clock start, something along those lines. Yeah. And then we did that full process for warm up, and then we did the full batting and then, you played your double header and then you went, you know, you're at the diamond for eight hours almost on those days. And most of us like Fizet always had eight o'clock or eight 30 uh, classes the next morning. It was, it was just time, but it was fun. I remember coming home and being exhausted, but I remember just having a great time being around everybody. So that, that made such a big difference. That's amazing. And you know, I, I so the season starts obviously. Yeah. And, um, any specific memories of you for for you know during the season that uh, stand out? We had some U.S. trips. We've yeah. laughed a little bit at George Brown's expense. We've talked about how tough McMaster and U of T are, but the, the, yeah. you have your, probably your own memories from during the season. And uh, tell me a little bit about what they would have would have been. Yeah, so it's kind of funny because I <laughs> I made the mistake of looking at the stats, <laughs> and, and I forgot. I honestly couldn't recall getting that many at bats in, in general. Um, and I remember being frustrated because I did hit, I actually had a few hits, but I hit it right at somebody, I think every time. Uh, and then I had a couple of strikeouts like most people do. But my, my one big memory, this is r ridiculous is, um, I actually got some time an inning or two at Cooperstown. Uh, I don't know if that was a throw the kid a bone type of thing, but it was amazing. And I remember catching and I remember looking out there and that whole atmosphere. And, and I had never been to Cooperstown either. Um, and I just thought this is the coolest thing ever. So I got, to, I got to catch, I think, two defensive innings maybe. And I got up to bat and I had to lay a bunt down. They wanted me to bunt. <laughs> and, and I did. I got it yeah. down and I actually had a sack bunt. And I, I, this is one of the only times I remember Coach McCray saying anything to the whole team about me. He's like, and Matt King – you know, spend this time on the on the bench and can, to come in and be able to put a bunt down when you're asking. It, it was that's something that stuck with me that he acknowledged that. And you know, I, I know that I didn't play a lot, but that that sticks with me as a a funny memory because I didn't bunt. I maybe a couple times in fastball I had to bunt, but I I don't remember bunting ever as a baseball player prior to that. Like I had I was at one of those. And I know the stats don't show up, but I was a hit for power, you know, a hit for contact to the opposite, like to the power alleys. And like, I was one of those guys, right? And then all of a sudden I got to come out cold and lay down a button. I was like, okay. <laughs> so that's a funny kind of memory that no one else will probably remember. But, um, you know, going into the States and traveling through upstate New York, I, you just felt like you were a ball player, right? You felt like you were, you know, doing the daily grind and you were showing up at these beautiful facilities and, and then all the craziness that went on at St. Bonnie's and, and, you know, playing Canisius and like, it was just a cool, cool experience. Uh, it's, it's great to hear. And, you know, like uh, coach McCray uh, never does anything to throw anyone a bone. <laughs> okay. He just doesn't, that's not his style. You, you got those earnings because you earned it. And not everything shows up on a stat sheet, Matt. Um, mm -hmm. I will say this, that um, McCray went out of his way to point out what it is that you were doing because Coach McCray and people who've played lots of baseball know that those things win games. You know, yeah. much more so than anything else. And I do remember, I think it was Coach LePage actually, um, talking about what a great leader you were through example and through positivity. And I know that the pitchers, um, to a whole, would just rave about how you, you, you approach your every day. You know, it isn't about always stats aren't measured just by what's on paper. You know, it's, um, you know, I, I, I kind of poke fun at evil cause he, he, he 
took a few ones on the chin there by leading off double headers against some of the American teams where our guys were a little bit on edge and didn't play at their best. So he may have given up a few more hits than he otherwise <laughs> would have and probably got no run support at times. Yeah. Um, and I never had to do that because I would always be slyly smiling because I'd throw the second half of a double header or, you know, um, where our guys were looser because we had already gotten our brains beat in. But you can't underestimate the contribution of leadership by example, positive attitude, a happiness and a joy to be there. And the fact that you dug in and did the job that is really hard for people. It's hard to put on equipment and go, you know, be involved with the early interactions of the pitchers, warm them up, catch them when they're bouncing it all over the place. Mm -hmm. Like that's, a, that's hard work. And uh, so, you know, there was a great appreciation internally for that. And, you know, I think everyone saw the way you, you performed in practice. So, you know, the hard part is we were deep at catch and oh, sure. we were super deep in the outfield. Like I, I never played on an outfield or with an outfield that was like that. I played on some teams where we had maybe one through nine comparable uh, talent for sure. Uh, but, you know, that's, uh, that's interesting. And, and you know, I, I'm sure that Coach McRae or Coach LePage, who are the two I remember talking about you the most, um, you know, that's why you were on the team was because you brought that into the mix. I, I did want to touch on one other thing that kind of endeared you to everybody. Oh. Um, you know, which was you were also everyone's favorite way to bypass the line and, and <laughs> not get kicked out of Isaac's. So um, you're working at the student pub at the time as security. Tell me a bit about that. Yeah, so that kind of came out of First of all, thank you for saying what you said. It, it, uh, I do appreciate that for sure. Um, but the Isaacs thing came out of nowhere, really. My um, some floor mates at the downtown student res and some guys that I had got to know were making a fortune there as bartenders and barbacks and doing all this stuff, and they needed some help. And and I kind of, as I said, I was kind of keen to get in and get out and. You know, I had this sort of picture in my mind of what I what I needed to do. And, and you know, I wanted to help. Like, I, I tried to really help pay for as much schooling as I could, too, at the same time. So I ended up getting the initially a part-time gig there because we were so busy. And then um, working security. And if, <laughs> one thing I will say, it was interesting that we did not have a football team. Um, because the, the size of some of the guys that would come to the bar was different than it would have been at some of the other schools. But, um, it, it, you know, it was fun. I, I remember being physically exhausted from working there, especially on some of the, the dance nights and things like that. And, and we always had this, they always played a heavy set when there was the, the mosh pit would start. And then we would have to circle around that to try to contain it a bit. And we would get beat up. So I was getting beat up at baseball and beat up at, at this. And I was just like, oh, my God, this is crazy. But it was, like an easy, it was an easy way to make some money for me in that it was consistent. It was a, it was a consistent job. The hours weren't great having to have early, early practices and early, um, um, early classes. But it, it was just another thing to get involved with and, and, and then try to you know, support my way through school too. So I couldn't imagine, but your new name is Dalton because you worked at the <laughs> roadhouse, uh, you know, that they may, they should have cast you in the remake here. Um, you know, Matt, what to, you know, we'll, we'll get into now what your memories are of going to nationals in Montreal. Yep. Um, what do you remember about that experience? And, you know, it was a, a different one for everybody for sure. Yeah, It's, it's funny because I, I knew that, I was going to have a pretty specific role and I was, I mean, Hey, we were going to nationals. That was great to begin with. Right. And, but I also was really impressed. I, re I remember being really impressed with the caliber of the pitching that we were facing. Um, and, and some of those guys, I know some of the other podcasts that talked about some, some specific people, but it, it was cool in that. Cause we kind of had, 
good luck in Ontario when, you know, we'd done really well against a lot of teams and, and all of a sudden we're getting there and, and it's like, okay, these, these are real teams too. Like this is the real deal. And, and this is, you know, as good as it gets in terms of pitching and, and you guys as a pitching staff were, I think really prepared to be there. And some of their guys were, it was just fun baseball. Like it was a really high caliber. Um, I remember as everyone does being absolutely frozen and I can't remember. I know for a fact I didn't have enough layers. I had, you know, a T-shirt and a long sleeve shirt and maybe a nylon shell that we had from maybe our, I don't know, phys ed program or something. Like that. It was ridiculous. And then having to warm up, which I didn't mind putting the gear on because it kept me at least a little bit warmer because it took a layer off, like, you know, added a layer. Um, so, you know, I don't remember a lot of specifics other than, you know, how close that final game was other than, being really impressed with the caliber of baseball that we were playing, uh, especially coming in as a first year team, right? Like, you know, it was, yeah, it was amazing indeed. to be there and amazing to see just what other teams had built. Right. Yeah. We beat two national champions on the way yeah. to the final. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I, I think collectively, uh, you know, people underestimate, the caliber of the teams that we had to beat. We, we ended up at the short straw in the round mm -hmm. robin. Funny enough, yep. even though we were the number one Ontario seed, we ended up in a group with Dalhousie, McGill, and U of T uh, was on the other side. So Dalhousie, McGill, and on the other side were Laval, uh, Saint, I think it was Francis Xavier, Acadia. It was Acadia and yep. U of T. Yep. So six teams there. Well, McGill had won the national championship the year before. Mm -hmm. And I had to pitch against the guy who was the reigning SEBA pitcher of the year yeah. with a really good team. I, you know, uh, and the Quebec teams are always older, so their guys are in their mid twenties, as opposed yep. to you know, especially with the law school at McGill, they had a lot of ex pros there, and John Elias from uh, the Expos was a coach. Laval, obviously, we know what Laval was all about. They had Plant and Bolduc and and Shabbat, and they were unbelievable from top to bottom. But people forget how good Dalhousie was because Dalhousie ended up winning the Nationals the very next year in St. Catharines and were stacked. Like, it was yeah. a stacked team. It was great. U of T was always tough. And, uh, you know, I don't know much about the Acadia team other than they finished first in the Atlantic Division uh, that year. So they obviously had beaten Dalhousie at some point. So... Like these are all very good teams, and you're right. The caliber caliber of pitching was great, but you know, I I kind of like to uh, to joke around about it because pitching, you know, all the way through was dominant. But it, it was probably because it was minus five degrees and snowing. You know, pretty hard to hit a ball. Yeah, for sure. And uh, especially when pitchers had been, you know, at that point, if you add the summer season to the fall season, there. Um, you know, I probably played in, you know, I think probably 70 games and started 15 times maybe. And so by that time, you're really at a point where you're at the height of your yeah. strength. If you're not hurt, you're really got the best velocity and the best snap and everything. Sure. And so it's hard. The, yeah. the, the great equalizer for the hitters, of course, was, was aluminum bats, which, yeah. uh, you know, kind of helped bail them out a lot, I think. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> for sure. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it is amazing, like, you know, at that time, such a big emphasis for anybody who played any baseball at any level was to go to the States, right? And, and to be able to, to, to prove, I think, to people that, you know, the Canadian kids could play ball too. And, you know, uh, it's looking back, it's like, you know, we were right there. Like we were, we were right there with, very good teams all season. And then, you know, the way that that finished, obviously we were right there too. So it's like, it's, it's amazing to, to think that really from, you know, that sign up sheet in the hallway and a little, you know, little training camp, you know, bringing some guys in that you had known and, and so on, but really just throwing things together and kind of figuring it out on along the way. And all of a sudden you end up at this, this championship with really talented baseball teams. And, and we held our own. It was, it was, it was fun. Yeah, and the program is 
you know, been great for, for 30 yeah. years. I don't think any of us have that foresight to be able to see 30 years in the, in the future. No. And um, so Matt, tell me a little bit about, you know, cause we'll get into some, what comes after, but yep. you know, the lessons you would have learned in that first year, some of the relationships that you built um, obviously helped make your year at school, you know, your second year of school really start to click. Yeah. Um, you know, what are some things you carry forth in life from your Brock baseball experience? Uh, you know, as a, you know, being in phys ed and coaching as much as I did, I think that really helped me to understand a lot of little nuances in, in you know, one being, you know, have something for people to do at practice, right? Like, you know, I think it was Rob or somebody had mentioned how organized the pitching practices were compared to just, you know, let's run some poles and throw a bullpen and catch some flies, which is sort of the standard. So I remember the pro I remember process, right? Process is important, which is, you know, but I also remember, and, and this kind of fit in perfectly to kind of my attitude, you know, you know, when you, when you are a good team and you have a goal, you go to work, right? You, you go to work, you, you don't get too emotional. The, you know, the highs and lows happen, but you can't show that. Um, and you, you just put in the time, put in the effort. And, you know, you know, they always say, oh, good things will happen. No, not always. Good things don't always happen. But at least you put yourself in a position to be successful. And that to me sticks, that sticks with me, you know, little funny little things, you know, at coach Kemp always had some snippets of things that I remember. Um, even Co Le Mark, uh, coach LePage, you know, I think if I might be wrong, but I think he ended up being one of the guys that had to come out early to a lot of the early practices for the catchers. Um, so I feel like he had helped us run a lot of drills and just that consistency and showing up and, and, and trying to do things the right way. I think that was so important. Um, you know, and it still is, it's still a big part of what I do every day. So that to me is, is, is huge. And then the other thing too, is, you know, being a team member is a really important thing. And I think, you know, understanding that, you know, we've all played on a ridiculous number of teams over the, over your career. Uh, and for me, it, it does get hard to piece them all together because they all run into one another. But being a team member of a really good group of guys, in this case, it was that's so important, right? And you know, you see it all the time when potentially better talent just is not fun to be around. Uh, maybe they're better players, but it's not fun to be around, and it makes the team, you know, potentially not as successful as it could be. So we we were we we were a good, we were good people. And we were, you know, everybody had a, they had, it was just so much fun. Like I just remember being so happy and being fun to be around these, our group. It was just that that's what I remember the most, I think. Yeah, it's funny some, sometimes, you know, when I saw Mark Kasoyan for the first time in 30 years, I, yeah. I just immediately started laughing because I remember how, what a ridiculous experience it was driving yeah. to some of those US places with, Kasoyan and Simmons in the back of the van <laughs> spinning their tales of debauchery. And I thought I, I couldn't have dialed up anything to, you know, um, that would make me laugh more than these two meetings <laughs> in the back, uh, you know, cause they were just so much, they were having so much fun and they were enjoying and living in the moment. And, um, you know, I think we all fed off of, we all, you know, we have that same rallying nature around Todd and I that we always yep. have had everyone was pulling for Todd from, from day for one, sure. uh, because he's just such a great, great guy, you know, yeah. like, you know, and, and I think, you know, everyone brings their own ray of sunshine into a pretty shiny, shiny room from that perspective. What, um, so what went into your decision at the end of that first year? And, and I know that a lot of people have said, well, it was the imposition of the spring schedule. It was a pretty intense couple of months. Academics were tough. Yep. You know, uh, in some cases, there were job offers in the mix. Um, like, what what happened in terms of where you went next uh, coming out of that first season of Brock? Yeah, so mine kind of is similar story. Um, 
as I mentioned, I, I really, in the back of my mind, had this goal of three years and out type of thing. And I don't know why. I don't know what the rush was looking back. But um, so I ended up picking up an extra course during that second semester after the season was over um, to kind of make sure that I was on track to to do what I wanted to do from a teaching perspective because I knew I wanted to teach high school. And as a high school teacher, you have to have two teachable subject areas. Right? So phys ed obviously was my major. Then I ended up taking geography courses and things like that as well so that I was ready for teacher's college or to be accepted to teacher's college. So I had picked up an extra course for second semester. And then the spring season or tryouts or whatever it was, like workouts, um, really, I just, I couldn't do it. I I thought to myself, and, and you know what? The decision to not come back was, it ate at me for a long time, to be honest, because I, I did enjoy it. I felt like I still had things to offer to the program, um, but I was ready to move on. Like I was ready to get that. I wanted to be a teacher. I was ready to do that. And for me to play again, I don't know if I would have been able to do it academically without not taking the full course load again in the fall. Um, so that was a big part of it. Um, and then it just, I just couldn't make it work. And that, that was probably the biggest thing between those two things. That's what, what probably drove the decision. I also, not because of the baseball part of it, but I also was a little bit like, I, I don't know if it was just the situation, but I, I lost almost 20 pounds during that baseball season. And part of it was the work. I mean, maybe I probably, maybe I had 20 pounds to lose. I don't remember, but um, I just was tired. And all of that at the same time, being kind of exhausted from the season mentally and worrying about the next step with academics and trying to get out of there in three years and all this stuff, it's, that kind of drove that decision, I think, the most. Stress is and can manifest itself in two ways. Yeah. It's, you know, a person who's suffering from stress, they generally don't stay their nice ideal way. They either lose a bunch <laughs> or they gain a bunch, right? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, so I think it's, there's always telltale signs that your body's telling you something. Yeah. Um, so Matt, tell me a little bit about, you know, the graduation and the, the advancement towards teaching and the decision to, you know, eventually uh, get involved with the family and settling yeah, back, so, back home. Funny enough, I ended up doing four years at Brock. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I had intentions of the three and out, but I started to get really interested in a number of different things that you're exposed to in the different programs. And I, I was throwing around the idea of, um, you know, the mental performance in sport. I really got attached to that for a while. I was thinking about doing a master's all of a sudden and my, my world kind of just went, haywire for a little bit there um and i also ended up teach, speaking to someone who was a teacher and they said if you're going to teach and they knew that i wanted to they said if you stick out your four years it makes a huge difference in your pay <laughs> uh, <laughs> how quickly you move up the grid and it, it certainly does because you don't have to take as many courses after you graduate so i ended up sticking out the four years at brock uh, with the phys ed degree um and then immediately got into Western for Teachers College. So I went there uh, right away. And the other big factor along the way, and, I, and again, I kind of sometimes wonder if I was in a hurry to grow up, but I had been dating this girl starting this spring prior to first year. And she went to Laurier and I went to Brock. Well, we somehow managed to keep it going throughout all of those four years. And uh, we ended up getting married in 1999. Um, okay. So we were, you know, I had finished my four years of schooling at Brock. I did my, my, I was in teacher's college. Uh, she was doing her thing at Laurier. Um, so we were married quite young. Um, and then in 99 as well, I started teaching. Uh, I got my first job. Um, at that time, they were pretty desperate for people. I had uh, done my practice teaching in Waterloo Board because um, my now wife, Kim, um, she was living at Laurier. She was still doing a, a diploma program of some sort, sort of post, post undergrad. And um, so I stayed with her and was able to get into the, the board like right away. 
And essentially, the day that I was done Alt House, I was supply teaching the very next day. Uh, so I, I got into the Waterloo board very quickly. And then we had to make some decisions about where we were going to live. And I was happy to be sort of that area because Waterloo and it, it, within an hour, I could drive anywhere. And, and I was just wanted a job. And living where I do, I, I always had to drive anyway. Like, you know, London was 40 minutes or Stratford was half an hour. Like everything was a drive. So we ended up moving right after we got married to Guelph. Um, and I was searching for a teaching job. I ended up getting one fairly quickly at Center Wellington in Fergus um, for what they call an LTO, which is those short-term contracts. And then immediately after that, I got a call from London, um, somebody that I had worked with at Western about this job at Saunders Secondary School, which is one of the bigger schools in London. And uh, they said, hey, we got an opening here. Why don't you come and see see if you can do it? And then from that point on, I, I've been in London board. Um, commuted from Guelph for a short amount of time, probably a semester. Then we ended up moving back to London. Um, spent 10 years here, started our family in London. Uh, and then eventually now uh, and have been for the last 15 years, um, moved back out towards where I grew up uh, out in the country uh, to raise our boys. So I've been teaching in the Thames Valley board for, I believe this is my 25th year coming up. Um, and been married, we'll be, we'll celebrate our 25th anniversary this year. That's outstanding, um, man. It's yeah, great. It's, uh, it's kind of a wild, wild, you don't remember it all, right? But, uh, you know, I've got three boys now. My sons are, um, my oldest is in the second year at Guelph. Uh, I won't hold that against them too much. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, my young or my middle son is in grade 12 currently. He's actually, you know, going through the process of looking at schools, which is a lot of fun because he's strongly considering Brock. Um, and then my youngest is in grade nine. So they've all been active. They've all been involved in different sports. And, and I've been able to coach not only, you know, club programming and rep, rep hockey, and but also at high school. I've, I've coached a ton actually over the years. So it, do you, do, do you make uh, do you make the players run wind sprints if you don't win the game? <laughs> I'm a little softer, but it is it is quite often one of the punishments. If we, if we don't, not not wind sprints, but uh, we work it in somehow. I was going to say, with you having early classes, do you remember when Mike put in those early morning conditioning workouts? Oh, it's six o'clock in the morning or whatever. That is six thirty, I think, and uh, those yeah. were brutal. Yeah, and I and I try to remember as well. I feel like sometimes we did some practices in the afternoon too, and for some reason I remember doing the catching stuff in the morning and then doing some outfield stuff in the afternoon. So just physically exhausted. And looking back, I remember like I've got multiple notes, if you want to call them, <laughs> that are just lines. Like you start off writing and then it's just like a straight line. It doesn't even. It's not even a sentence anymore. <laughs> must have fallen asleep or dozed off or something and, and yeah it was uh but it got you prepared to, to wake up and go right it got you prepared to compete and which is a big part of sport you got to be able to participate whenever you're it's, it's your turn to, to to do something yeah i don't remember who said it but um it doesn't strike me as unusual yeah. given mike's <laughs> higher level coaching um that he did this those early morning uh conditioning stints, which we all hated, yeah. uh, but he did that to prep us for the Durham College Tournament because we were going to be starting early and you can't argue with results. We won the, the yeah. tournament. And, you know, I think it also knocked off any complacency, which, you know, is just something that Mike is brilliant. And I will tell it when I eventually get him on one of these. Um, there was a practice right before we went to nationals where he, you know, he was really hard on us and said mm -hmm. we were kind of loafing and doing whatever. And, uh, but I remember at the time thinking, well, we had won a whole bunch of games in a row and, you know, it didn't, it didn't seem any different than any other practice we had done. And uh, afterwards, it was one of the few times I talked to Mike as kind of coach yeah. outside of the, you know, Pullman go pitch 25 or whatever. Um, and he said to me, did you like that? I said, did you like what? I'm like, what, what, what was that? And he's like, yeah, I did that on purpose. I, I, I just felt we were getting a little complacent. I wanted to shake everyone up mentally. Yeah. So 
you know, I hate to say it, you know, I was probably living in a world of checkers and Mike McRae was playing chess. Like he was just, you know, thinking of all these things, mentally, complacency, the physicality of early morning games and tournaments or nationals, those kinds of things. And he was just preparing us to be the best we could possibly be. And I've said that his gift, which I can never thank him enough for, was he exposed all of us to an understanding of what it takes to be great just yourself, you know, and yep. without having visibility to that, people have no idea where, what they can do. And mm-hmm. I think that our people have done amazing things in life. So to that end, why don't you tell us, you know, the greatness of the Matt King life, which is what <laughs> you're doing today, actually. And, and your family is an obviously great scenario, but I yep. also know what you're doing professionally is really cool and people should... Yeah get an understanding of that so i'm still technically teaching i'm still in the i'm technically on paper a phys ed teacher in thames valley but i've recently uh have become um the lead teacher of a program called the academy for student athlete development and it is a partnership program that thames valley is running with a group that's actually based out of whitby and um it is a program for high performance athletes and the goal is to support them in in their process of, of becoming better. Um, so what and how this works is um, students, student athletes come to an offsite location. I'm actually offsite and I'm not at a school. Uh, I'm actually at the Western Fair. Uh, the, the arena is my classroom is actually in the arena um, at the Western Fair Sports Center there. But um, so they, the students come to our program for half a day or two periods of high school and they do um, strength and conditioning or technical training every day dependent upon their sports stream as well as a classroom session and i am the classroom teacher for them Um, so i teach their phys ed curriculum as well as kind of a learning support teacher for their other courses so they're they're doing an online class quite a lot of them are doing an online class um, and I'm helping with their courses that they do at the regular school, trying to give them back some time, which sounds really strange saying, come, talking about a program where we'd spent so much time, but having that an understanding of performing at a high level for any sport is time consuming, right? We've, they've, you've got travel, you've got games, you've got tournaments, you've got practices. And then most of them have, like a lot of us did too, you've got skill development, you know, hockey players have extra skating, they might have shooting, they might have a trainer. Um, so the goal of this program is to try to do some of that during the school day. Um, so every day, as I said, they get a weight room session or hockey players get an on ice section, you know, twice a week. Um, our volleyball group does an on court session. Um, and then we've got a number of other athletes who just, there's just not quite enough of them to bring in an extra coach. But they're getting activity that is structured and, and designed for them uh, to perform at a higher level, as well as athletic support, um, whatever they need that way. They get academic support. I guess that's me. Um, and then we also have a sports psychologist that comes in once a month and does a session with our group. We have a sport nutritionist that comes in and does sessions with the players. So it's really about preparation for them being their best at whatever their next step is. It's, it's really neat. Yeah, it's, it's outstanding. It sounds like it's the perfect recipe of the things that you were thinking about while you were prepping to be a teacher, but also exposed to, you know, Coach McRae was, is an educator too, right? Yep. A teacher. And, um, you know, I think from that perspective, it was just really interesting to see how that all, it's kind of like the perfect, you know, I hate to think of, you know, you as the father of something and Coach McRae is the mother of what it is that you're doing. But, you know, in the end of the day, and I, I joke about that because uh, yeah. I think someone talked about the, the program is something that Ted and I gave birth to. And I was like, Ted was definitely the mom. That's all I'm saying. But um, but this sounds like it's a like the perfect extension of something that you lived 30 years ago. Yeah, it worked out amazingly well. Like, you know, like a lot of us have those sort of leadership roles. I was asked quite early to consider 
um, the administration part of teaching, but I didn't want to because I wanted to coach. I loved coaching and, and the high school seasons, uh, especially at, I was fortunate enough to work at two very, uh, technically I'm at Lucas right now in London, but Saunders and Lucas are big schools and they're athletic and, you know, high school sports are important to, to everybody. And, and we take it seriously. They, you know, it's a, it's a commitment. And I wanted to continue doing that. So I was, I was fortunate enough to, you know, I've coached track and field over the years. I've done, um, I did hockey both at the high school level and community level. I coached volleyball both at the high school level and club level. Um, and I've coached baseball both at the community level and at the high school level uh, and was really actually became one of the first coaches of uh, the team that had Saunders in 2010. So it's, you know, I was always involved and, and I'll thank in this, you know, as you know, like my wife is amazing supportive of this stuff because many times there was five six seven teams a year where i was you know busy either with our own family or or some other people's kids um but all of those experiences combined with that experience at brock um really set me up well to you know be fortunate enough to be put into a position where i could interview and, and luckily be successful to get this job it's amazing, Matt. I, I'm, I'm, we're proud of you, obviously. The program's oh. proud of you. Um, tell me, you know, we'll, we'll change gears here a little bit. Um, since you were an Isaac's employee, you now <laughs> have to name a bar that you would go to not wearing a blue. Uh, I, if I recall the, the, the Bounce crew, they were wearing, like, it was like the Brock colors, but it was a, a golf shirt, maybe. Yeah. Um, when you were out of that, did you have a favorite haunt that you would go to? It's funny you mentioned the golf shirt because they were always too small. I don't know if they did that. <laughs> they just purpose. want to make your muscles look bigger. Apparently, so. apparently. But it was funny because they actually had to switch them because we started to have some issues and they had to make them more visible. So that we actually, I've got this really beautiful, bright yellow shirt at home. I think they put on the back, the Minister of the Environment is what they called us. Uh, and uh, <laughs> we ended up changing colors because, you know, uh, th that was a sort of mosh pit era. Right? Yeah. And uh, there was there were some issues with you couldn't see the blue. You couldn't see who was on your side, essentially, when you were trying to calm things down. So, um, but I do remember, like, obviously, I spent a lot of time at Isaac's, but um, we knew a lot of the other security members around town eventually, right? So, Gorgeous Shooters, obviously, was a big one. Uh, Front 54. Uh, we, we visited a fair bit. And I remember as a baseball team too, we would go there a little bit yeah. to, to watch Grooch dance and, uh, poorly. We might have. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it, it's funny because I trying to remember the uh, chili, pepper, red hot chili pepper, um, yeah. was another one. We, we did it. We did well that way. I think we traveled well. <laughs> we did. And we would wear those, uh, you know, crazy gray, yeah. fundraising shirts and you know it's a funny part of the, this weekend that we're plotting in september which i've got some news i've got to put out on the back end of this podcast because yeah. it's, it's moving back a weekend um to the 20th 21st 22nd of september okay. because there's just an ability to uh do things more economically and, and, and have yeah. hotel avail availabilities i said to them you know we, we, uh, it's Grape and Wine Festival on the 30th and, and oh. everything's booked already. So, you know, it, it just makes it more efficient for us. But um, well, and, and I know people are appreciative of your efforts because administratively, that's a, I can just imagine that that's got to be a nightmare. It's a, bit, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a chore. <laughs> yeah. You know, but the first time I started this, we, we, we got involved with with COVID. And right. we thought we were clear enough of COVID to be able to do it. But the problem with it was that there was still problems at the Canadian U S border yep. and people don't understand that there still is issues with Americans, Canadianized Americans. Uh, they're living in the U S working in the U S coming back over at that yep. point was not going to happen. So people like coach McRae, there were several, a couple of guys on Mac, but Mike Gilroy is also in Tennessee mm -hmm. um, that, we're going to have difficulties and it doesn't make any sense to put an yep. event of this magnitude together unless everyone's capable of coming. Right. Yeah, and, sure. um, you know, I think there's always that there, there, there's always 
difficulties with making sure that the university itself is on board um, because it's a large independent group of people getting together. So, mm -hmm. you know, we just want to do the right thing. And it's, it's easy to do the right thing when you sit down with Todd, you yep. know, like Todd, yep. every time on the Brock side, it's just like, yeah, you know, we'd run through <laughs> a brick wall for that guy. On the McMaster side, I obviously knew Brad Reeson very well. And, yep. and unfortunately, Brad's not with us, but his family is with us. And, you know, I think those guys are equally fired up about doing something where we can give back after 30 years. But the, the best part is really just reconnecting with people after 30 years. You know, it's, a, oh. um, it's amazing just what it's like because it's like 30 years hasn't happened. We're all sitting in the dugout again for the two and yeah. a half hours we're warming up. <laughs> and, you know, just having those crazy and i think it's unique you know to baseball because i think in hockey if you're sitting on a bench you're panting because you just got yeah. off the ice yeah. and you're trying to get oxygen back but baseball is paced in such a way that there's downtime between games if you're playing a double header you know during a game you're gonna have of course you're gonna be talking about what's going on in the field or what you're going to be thinking about, but there's also other things like, Hey, isn't that mountain range cool in the back yeah. here? Yeah. Adventure or, you know, there's a lot of driving time. So, you know, you got to know, um, all 26, 28, 32, if you 34, if you count the coaches, um, people involved and some of them you get to know really well. And then, yeah. you know, it kind of gets buried under 30 years of dust and now we're blowing it all off. And it's like, <laughs> You know, I, I'm sure a lot of people understand now that Chris Peters was a pretty funny guy. Oh, yeah. you sit through his podcast, you're going to be dying laughing because of he pokes fun of Gucci. <laughs> you know, I forgot how thoughtful Chris Gucci was because, you know, I, I'd seen him at, at hockey. Our kids played against each other. And, and Chris yeah. always a thoughtful, calm guy, but, you know, pretty quiet because he was battling his health issues. But yeah. it was great to see him open up and just talk about how significant all this was in his life. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I think certain people, this gives a platform for them to kind of go, you know what, after 30 years, it'd be good to get together with this group of guys because it was a really special bunch of people and it set me up pretty well for life. Yeah, it uh, definitely has forced me to, to, to kind of go down that rabbit hole of, you know, and, and I've always kind of been, and part of it's because you get involved with so many different things. So you're kind of coming and going and in and out, but I, you know, I, I'm not the most outgoing, at, you know, person at first until I guess until I get comfortable with things and, you know, definitely more on the introverted side of things, I would say. And I, you could probably vouch for that, but, um, but being a part of a team was always, it's, that's always one of the things that I, I love. I just, I just love being part of a team. And, and, you know, I was a little, it's funny cause I was a little hesitant. I'm like, there's no way that I'm going to go back to Brock and play this baseball game. And no one really, you know, who's going to remember any of this stuff. And then I started listening to the podcast and chatting with you a couple of times briefly. And I was like, wait a second, that was awesome. <laughs> Those guys were, you know, I really do want to know what, what guys are up to. Right. And I, I really liked to hear their story and, and see what they've been, what they've been doing for the last little bit. Cause I really haven't seen anybody other than that brief stint. I meant, you know, I saw you, whichever that was probably, that had to be at least 20 years ago. Yep. Um, it, it's been a long time for, for most people. So I'm just, I'm really happy to see everybody. Uh, well, we'll see whether you still have that opinion after someone bounces <laughs> a curveball, but <laughs> Uh, listen, Matt, I've become, um, I've become really good at sitting on a pail. <laughs> <laughs> um, amazing. Listen, I really appreciate it. I think it's great. You're doing amazing and we're looking forward to seeing you. I, uh, thank you so much for today. Oh, thanks Mike. And thanks for putting this all together. I'm, I'm looking forward to some time. Smith.